I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. This week, Iran took two major steps in breaking away from the 2015 nuclear deal, building up its potential for developing nuclear weapons. That country announced Monday it was doubling its number of advanced centrifuges. And Tuesday, Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, said that his government will start injecting uranium gas into more than 1,000 centrifuges, another step toward allowing Iran to produce enriched uranium. Those centrifuges are, a, are part of the a precursor for a nuclear facility which sits deep inside a mountain. Israel at one point threatened to bomb Iranian nuclear sites like Fordo. Our CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell is with us now from Jerusalem with more on the threat from Iran. So Chris, we see that Israel threatened to bomb some of Iran's nuclear facilities. What is the possibility that Israel would actually do that? Well, it is a possibility, uh, Ephraim, and uh, first of all, you have to ask the question, is it possible? First of all, on the defense, uh, Iran has been doing what it can uh, to forestall the possibility of an attack. The way they've done that is they've uh, spread out their nuclear facil facilities throughout Iran, and they have built underground facilities like Fordo that have been concrete hardened uh, to protect against any air attack uh, by, the, by the air. And the, uh, the other thing is that they realized back in 1981, Israel attacked Iraq's nuclear facility, which just won, and they realized uh, to prevent that, they've spread those out all around. On the offense, uh, what Israel has been doing, they have F-35s. These are the most sophisticated fighters fighter jets uh, they can find. They can probably go through uh, Iranian airspace. There have also been anecdotal things, like they have tested, you know, what it's like to go from the distance from Israel to Iran. They've flown those flights uh, over the Mediterranean. And uh, they've done what they can. Eventually, it's going to be a political decision whether or not they do that. And we have heard of stories where actually uh, the, the Israeli security cabinet has actually uh, gone ahead and and gone ahead and said we can fight then and uh, do that uh, do that attack against Iran's nuclear facilities, but there were they finally pulled back. So it is a possibility. Eventually, it's going to be a political decision whether Israel goes ahead and do that. Now we know Iran has nuclear ambitions, but what are some other ways where Iran is threatening Israel? Well, Ephraim, they're actually trying to surround Israel. Uh, if you look in uh, Israel's northern border, Hezbollah at one time had about 14,000 rockets back in 2006. They have about 150,000 rockets now. Uh, they have rockets in Yemen. They have rockets in Gaza. They also have rockets, uh, they believe, stationed in Syria and Iraq. So actually, they're trying to surround uh, Israel with threats of precision guided missiles. Back in 2006, we were on the uh, uh, Lebanese Israeli border, and they, they fired 4,000 rockets during the Second Lebanon War. It basically paralyzed northern Israel. You can imagine what would happen now with 150,000 
and rockets coming from the north, south, and uh, from the east as well. And also trying to build a land bridge. And Ephraim, what does that mean? It means that they're trying to gain territory and influence over places in Syria and Iraq, Lebanon, and they want to build this land bridge all the way from uh, Tehran to the Mediterranean, all in the goal of trying to destroy the Jewish state. They say that often, they say that openly, they want to eliminate Israel, and they're trying to do it by precision-guided missiles and ultimately by a nuclear weapon. So, Chris, if Israel and Iran went to war, how do you see the U.S. involved? Well, it's a great question, uh, Ephraim. Right now, the, uh, the U.S. has facilities. They have Patriot uh, missile battle batteries here in Israel. They have them in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have Juniper Cobra, which is these uh, annual uh, military exercises between the United States and Israel. Uh, and you also believe that the United States would have the back of Israel in, in case of an open war against Israel. Just a few uh, couple of weeks ago, Israeli uh, U.S. Secretary Mike Pompeo visited uh, Israeli Secretary Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, so there's a close relationship with the U.S. and Israel. And you would imagine in any case of an open war against uh, between Israel and Iran that the United States would be standing with the Jewish state militarily, legally, and diplomatically as well. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6 that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9. In that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34-39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Boucher nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, 
until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49:36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Beth Garma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, 
and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, 9 For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming as we read in Matthew 16, 1-3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.